what's up. I really love this recipe because there's a lot of straight up classical cookery involved. You're searing, deglazing, thickening stuff, making sauces, all the techniques that I was super excited about when I first started cooking. So today I'm gonna show you how to make a very good tasting beef stroganoff with tender beef, a deeply flavorful mushroom wine sauce and buttery noodles to soak it all up. To get started, I'll need some beef. Today I'm using two pounds of relatively thin cross cut sirloin steaks. I prefer sirloin to the more traditional filet mignon for stroganoff for three reasons. One, it's cheaper. Two, it has more flavor than filet mignon. And three, it's easy to make just as tender as filet with a few tricks. By the way, if you can't find a thin cut sirloin like this one, check out my fajita video for how to take a thick sirloin and bring it closer to this form factor. Step one in making these more tender is to jacquard them with a fork. To do that, I'll just poke each side of these sirloins about a hundred times or so. If you're not familiar, a jacquard is a meat tenderizing tool that uses mechanical force to break down the protein structure in meat, making it more tender. It essentially pre-chews the meat for your mouth, and it sounds gross, but it works really well. A fork is a good stand-in for the actual jacquard tool, which I'm assuming you don't have. Next, I'll flip these over and poke them on the back side, and once I've got both sides of both steaks well jacquarded, it's time for tenderization, step two. For that, I'll load both both steaks into a freezer bag and then add in 50 grams of soy sauce and 15 grams of wurch. The soy sauce is going to continue to break down some of the proteins in the meat, making it even more tender than just physical tenderization. Now I'll marinate this for 15 to 20 minutes in the fridge while I sort out my knife work. For that, I've got a medium white onion and one pound or 450 grams of mushrooms. I'll give the onion a medium dice here because in this dish, the onion mainly serves as a way to bring some savory sweetness to the overall flavor and we don't really want its texture, so smaller is better. For the mushrooms, I've got creminis here, but button, shiitake, or oysters would also work fine. And to prep them for the pot, I'll give each mushroom a medium to thin slice crosswise like this. Too thin and they'll break apart when we stir them and they won't have any texture. And too thick, they'll be kind of wet and overly squishy. The last little bit of veg prep here is to just squish four to five large garlic cloves through my garlic press, or just mince it with a knife or rasp it on your microplane. Once I've got my aromatic base and mushrooms sorted out, it's time to cook this thing. So first, I'll drop a medium large pot of water on the stove and bring it up to a boil. Then I'll drop a heavy bottom pot, or in this case, my six and a half quart Dutch oven and drop that on the stove on the other side over high heat. I'll give both of these pots a second to warm up and do their thing. And then I'll grab my marinated tenderized beef from the fridge to dry it off so I don't splatter hot oil all over myself when I go to sear it. For that, I'll just lay these steaks out on some double lined paper towels and then dab them off as well as I possibly can. That's looking tender, that's looking dry, they're ready for the pot. Over at the stove, my pot is ripping hot, so I'll add in a good long squeezer of high smoke point oil, and then I'll add in my steaks one at a time. To make sure these steaks are reaching their full potential sear-wise, I think it's really important to come back with a spatula once they're in the pot to press them down. This gets more surface area in contact with the hot pot and helps prevent the meat from steaming instead of searing. This is what it looks like if you don't press down, by the way pale, gray, and overall just not that pro. After 90 seconds of searing these hot on the first side, I'm gonna come back to check and see how they're looking. And that's a great sear. So I'm gonna flip over steak one, then steak two. And from there, I'll continue to sear these on the back side for another two to three minutes. Two to three minutes later, at this point, side duh is looking all golden and seared up. So I'm gonna move these over to a plate to rest while I make the mushroom wine sauce to bathe them in. To confirm temp, I'll use my instant read thermo here. 128 to 130F is what I'm looking for because that's gonna rest up to a nice rosy pink medium. Back at the stove, I'll keep on cooking. Now, in goes a little squeezer of oil, then all of my mushrooms a strong pinch of salt, and then I'll stir all that to combine. As these mushrooms cook, they're gonna release a lot of water. That water's gonna help deglaze all that super flavorful beef stuff that we just got stuck on to the bottom of this pot. I'll give these about two minutes to get juicy, and now I'm gonna use the wooden spoon here to scrape up the seared beef fun and reduce soy sauce that got stuck to the pot. And once I've got the bottom of this pan cleaned up, I'm gonna continue to saute these mushrooms for two to three more minutes. Once we're there, I'll add in all of my chopped white onion with another strong pinch of salt. That's gonna help draw out some of the water in the onion, which is gonna in turn deglaze all the mushroom stuff that's now getting stuck to the bottom of this pan. Now a quick stir to get all that mixed up. And from here, I'm gonna saute these two together for three to four minutes on high heat, stirring every minute or so. When the onions and mushrooms are getting nice and caramelized and the bottom of this pot is all gunked up, once again, I'll add in my garlic. Just a brief saute for maybe 10 to 15 seconds here to get the aroma opened up. And then in goes a healthy glass of white wine or about 175 grams worth. By the way, I'm just using Boda Box Chardonnay, also known as the green monster in my house. 
The wine's gonna come up to a simmer basically right away, and at that point I'll jump back into the pot with a wooden spoon to scrape up the bottom. At this point, we've built a ton of flavor. We keep glazing and deglazing, and each time we're compounding all of that dark roastiness from the beef and the onions and the mushrooms. About a minute of simmer time later, this wine is fully reduced, so next in goes 25 grams of tomato paste and 15 grams of all-purpose flour. The tomato paste is gonna bring a nice, round, robust depth to this dish without making things taste tomato-y, and the flour is here to help thicken this sauce just a little bit. It's not gravy, you guys, just keep that in mind as you go, and if it gets a little too thick, you might need to add some stock. After one minute of frying this tomato paste in flour, it's looking nice and glazed up one more time, so we'll come back and deglaze with 400 grams of gelatin-infused beef broth. To prep this broth, all I did was take 400 grams of boring tasting store-bought beef stock and add three packets of powdered gelatin. Stir that to combine and now we've got a stock that has the body of something that's been cooked for a long time without using gelatinous bones and a ton of meat. This is going to improve the texture of the sauce a lot. It's a really great move for home sauces in general when you don't have access to or time to make a really expensive full-bodied stock. One more stir to get the bottom cleaned up here, then I'll bring the gelatin stock to a simmer. That's going to ensure the powdered stuff that we mixed in gets fully melted before we add anything else. Then in goes 25 grams of nice tasting Dijon mustard. When I say nice, I mean this brand, my mustard. I think that's how you pronounce it. Then in goes 20 grams of wurch and three grams of fresh ground black pepper. Now, one last stir to combine, then I'll drop the heat on this burner to low and simmer this for 10 minutes to unify the flavors. I'll pop a lid on to do that. On the other side of my stove, this water is rolling hot, so I'm gonna use this 10 minutes of downtime to cook the pasta. I'll add in a strong grip of salt, Make that too, then in goes a pound or 450 grams of Campanelle style pasta. A quick stir to make sure nothing's stuck together and I'll cook per package instructions, or in this case, about eight to nine minutes. Like I said, this pasta shape is called Campanelle. It's essentially a fancy version of the spiral cut egg noodles that you see at the grocery store. These are a little thicker and bronze cut, which I love because that brings a little bit of added texture to the outside of the noodle, which grips the silky sauce a lot better than your average noodle. Now, while this pasta cooks, I'm gonna thank Tipsy Sock for sponsoring this video. Tipsy Sake is the largest online sake retailer in the US. They carry over 400 labels you can choose from, or if you're feeling adventurous and want to try some new things, check out their Sake Club membership where you get a curated box of six sakes every three months and tasting cards to match. Each tasting card tells you about the brewery where the sake was made and gives you tasting notes, food pairings, and serving temperature suggestions. This bottle of Tokubetsu Honjozo was made by Tateyama Brewing Company in Tanami city. It's best served warm or cold. It has a crisp, dry flavor and pairs well with meat or seafood. Pretty versatile. Aside from the bottles and tasting cards, members get access to tasting videos, a newsletter, unlimited free shipping, special members-only pricing, and this beginner's guide to sake. Sake noobs like me can use this guide to learn a lot more about what you're drinking, like the history of sake, how it's brewed, and typical pairings. So click the link in my description for 10% off all products with code BRIAN or $30 off your first tip sake box with code brian30 again that's code brian for 10 percent off or code brian30 for 30 dollars off your first sake box thank you tipsy after eight minutes of boiling i'm going to swoop in and grab a few of these nudes to see how they're doing and that's perfect not crunchy, but a little chewsome and definitely not overcooked and limp. From here, I'm gonna drain this over at the sink, but not fully. I wanna leave about a quarter cup's worth of water sitting in the bottom of this pot so I have something to work with when I add my butter. Speaking of that, I'm gonna cut up just over a half a stick or about 65 grams worth of butter and then add that into my pot and stir to emulsify as it melts. Look, we all love buttered noodles, but just adding butter to noodles straight up gets greasy. Having a little water in the mix helps hold the butter in an emulsion and creates a silky butter sauce that grips the noodles in a much more pro level way. Next, the last move before outright finishing this dish is to slice the sirloin. I'm doing that against the grain and thinly to maximize tenderness. I want the final texture of the beef in this dish to be slightly more chewsome than shredded braised beef, but way less chewy than a piece of cooked steak. Once sliced, I'm going to come back and cut those slices into more bite-sized pieces as opposed to longer strips. And to show you the final texture of this meat, check out how it shreds apart with only a little bit of force. My teeth are going to have to do a little work, but barely. That's ideal. Oh, and if you see any sinewy bits in the meat like this, zip those out. 
Those are bad. Back at the stove, it's been about 10 to 12 minutes of simmering over low heat and my sauce is nicely thickened and everything inside is tender and mucho flavorful. To finish this sauce, I'll add in 75 grams of heavy cream and stir that in to combine. The added fat from the cream is gonna balance out the acidity from the white wine and round off and slightly dull the almost too flavorful intensity of this dark meaty sauce. The final texture should be thick, but not gravy. If yours is too thick, maybe add a splash of stock to get it where it needs to be. Lastly, I'll add in all of my sliced beef and any of the accumulated juices from the plate and then stir that to combine. Now I'll pop on a lid and simmer this over low heat for just about another minute or so so I can cook this steak just a little bit more. Since we took at least four steps so far to ensure the tenderness of the meat, the elevated temp is not going to make it tough or dry it out. After 60 to 90 seconds of low simmering, this beef is slightly more cooked, the sauce is all glossy, and now it's gripping everything perfectly. Now the true last step in a saucy dish like this is to taste it for salt level. Like I've said many times before, a technically perfectly executed dish can still be bland and boring without the proper amount of salt. And that tastes good. Now to serve this, I'll drop some of my velvety butter noodles into the middle of a plate that can hold a little bit of sauce. Then about a fourth of the stroganoff that we just made, this recipe should easily serve for adults. A little bit more sauce on top to make sure everything is well lubed up. And then lastly, a tiny bit of fresh parsley and dill to bring a little brightness and a little bit of green prettiness to a very brown and beige plate of food. You guys, obviously saucy tender beef with buttered noodles is sick, but it's also fun to make. This dish keeps you engaged, interested, and teaches you how to build up a monumental level of flavor from the ground up. Plus, it makes you feel super happy afterwards when you eat it. It's a classic win-win, you guys. I hope you make it soon. Let's eat this freaking thing.